Thank you so much. I mean, how are all of you doing? Really doing great. Uh, just all of these talks have been phenomenal. And I've noticed a few key threads, which is one, uh, we can't change big behaviors overnight. Uh, I'm trying to decolonize not just the internet, but everything. And I don't think that can be done in 10 talks or 20 talks. So that's one. Two, but we can change behaviors and we can measure, measure those changes and behaviors are reinforced by community. And I've actually heard those themes woven across a lot of different contexts. So I'm excited to kind of bring that over into this talk. So my name is Candice. Um, before I, I was in tech, I was a teacher. So a lot of my background is in um, instructional design, which is trying to figure out if I have a huge goal, like how to make someone literate who was not before, or how to help someone share more, or even just have better outcomes at home, at school, at work. What are the ways that I can actually break that down into smaller behaviors and then measure that and work toward that in a very empathetic way? So that's my background. So then after teaching, I switched into tech. I became a copywriter for Fortune 500 companies. Um, so I've worked on the agency side. I've been a, a vendor. Now I work in-house for a podcasting company. So every day I'm writing a lot of things and I'm editing and I'm also working with people inside and outside of my company. And just as a black queer person, I've noticed a lot that there are appropriative things that happen in marketing. So it's really not just marketing though. I've seen it in tech documentation. I've seen it in the names of technical updates, patches, and products. I've seen it in internal emails and GIFs. And I think for, the, for this presentation, I'm going to narrow it and say, I'm gonna talk about a, um, appropriation as it happens for capitalist ventures, whether that is for-profit or non-profit. Um, if a company or a person is trying to make money uh, by representing something, and they are using cultural artifacts from the non-dominant culture, there are steps that have to be taken to make sure that that comes out as appreciation and not just stealing. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Everyone take a deep breath, it'll be okay. So, um, <laughs> didn't wanna scare you. The exits are here if uh, it's too much. So, when I say appropriation in a capitalist context, I'm talking about when a business or person makes a profit off of using a cultural art artifact that's from a non-dominant culture without consent, without attribution, and also without paying anyone back. So for example, what is a cultural artifact? It could be what people call slang, which actually, what someone calls slang is actually someone's language or style of speaking, so we have to be very careful there. It could be a style of speaking, it could be how someone dresses, it could be a pattern. I mean, the clothing I'm wearing now, I'm not actually exactly sure if it's appropriative or not because I'm not sure if the artists from different cultures who came up with it were actually compensated or if it was just lifted. So you can, you can appropriate many different things. And we're gonna talk a lot today about speech, I think, and stuff around that, and also imagery. Um, so, the first example I wanted to give was of patterns. Like we all are immersed in patterns and we don't think about where they come from on a visual level. And this lawsuit, it's the Navajo Nation versus Urban Outfitters, it was just settled because there were many products over 20 that used a pattern that had been developed over centuries without any kind of compensation. It was called Nava it was called a Navajo pattern, but they didn't contact that group or they didn't try to compensate them in any way. So this is one example of the court getting involved to make sure, or it went into litigation to make sure that companies were actually honoring and also paying where things came from. So it's not really, it's a spectrum, right? So there's appreciation on one side and there's appropriation on the other. And appropriation is dangerous because it erases people, it erases histories, it erases contributions, and it means that people are not paid. It means that they get less access to opportunities. So this isn't just me talking about tweets, like you need to cite that tweet and pay that person. It's how do we elevate voices who are not being talked about? And I think that black teens in this 
country are contributing a lot to the culture, but a lot of what they create is being stripped and put into marketing material, and they don't see the benefit of that, even if they buy those products. So actually, it's almost like they're paying for marketing machines that steals their content. And this is a big problem, especially with social media. Um, so this is an example. It's called the Mannequin Challenge. Definitely take a look if you ha haven't seen it. Uh, on the image on, the, uh, on my right, the furthest right, that is the first known video, which is really awesome. It's uh, black teens, they have a camera. Everyone's very still and the camera progresses through a very complicated scene. It's actually hilarious. Um, and then as you've probably seen, Hillary Clinton did a mannequin challenge on her campaign plane. Multiple brands, Target, you know, all doing these videos. Do I know if all of these are um, appropriation? Well, that depends. Who did they pay in the creation of these things? Did they hire a multicultural agency? Do they have black teens in their office? Did they actually reach out to these creators? Sometimes that happens, but usually it doesn't. So I'm not here to say, yes, this is appropriative and it's wrong, don't do it. I'm saying that whenever you see something, whenever you see a company, and chances are their leadership and their workers are, have a dominant culture and they're using artifacts from outside of that culture, a little light bulb should pop up and everyone should, should just start thinking, hmm, how was this actually executed? This is an example from my Gmail inbox. So this is an email I received from Twitter and it says, teacher C, you've got some fire tweets. True, I do have some fire <laughs> tweets, but like I'm a black person and this is African American vernacular English, a lot of really cool things that black people are doing with language involve actually pictures and emojis and all of that. And one thing I know about Twitter is that it's 2% black. So I don't know how th this was created, but my question for Twitter is if you're 2% black, why are you emailing me, a black person, with AAVE to like get me to pay for this product or to use this product? Um, I don't know if anybody from, from Twitter is here <laughs> to answer that, but that's just a question that I had to put up there. So now that we've had a few examples, I wanted to go into more of a framework and maybe some ideas to where you can deter this at a place of work because that could be very tricky. So coming back to what cultural appreciation means, it means that there's some level of consent, of attribution, and also you're paying people. Um, and it's strange that in this day and age that people are very hesitant to pay content creators and people who originate ideas for their work. I think that that's a problem, especially when the people who don't get paid are people from underserved communities and from marginalized communities. So at the end of the day, one step of decolonizing something is to make sure that we actually stop erasing people who build dominant cultures. Um, so this is kind of a framework I use. Is it appreciation or is it appropriation? And usually it's a big, it could be all over the place for one company, it could be a gray area, but it's important to really think about it. So my first point is always center folks under siege, and I use under siege instead of marginalized because it's active. Um, I, like, I don't think I'm sitting in a room and I'm just being marginalized. I think that my identity is under siege. I think that things are being stolen from me. I think that my history has been erased. And I think that that is a very active process. And so if you're working pe with people who are people of color, uh, they're immigrants, they're Muslims, they speak a different language than English, maybe they come from a different class background that's not in your company, you have to really center them. And what I find is that in tech, people who have privilege often center themselves even when they're trying to be diverse. So the point isn't to stand up and say, we need to be diverse or we need to be inclusive. It's like if you realize that that's happening, one, like make friends from all different groups, like get some black friends, make friends with people who speak different languages, make friends with queer people, start there. And then instead of using your voice to dictate what's diverse or not, or racist and not, use your light to shine it on that person and say, hey, you know, without adding too much extra work for you, you know, um, let's fi find a way to talk about this where you're not doing the work, but I'm not taking all of the credit or being seen as the expert. It's about changing the power dynamic in this, which is why this is very complicated. There aren't 
five steps, right? It's actually a framework of thinking. It's how do you change how people think. So, and then also, this has been talked about a lot in really all the talks. It's understanding your privilege and your point of influence. So when I first switched from teaching into tech, it was, I think, 2011 or 2012, and I had a very low level of privilege at my place of work. Um, I was one of the very few openly queer people. I was one of the very few openly black people. And, um, I don't know if people identify as black, but like you walk into a room, it's like, oh, black person, black, like that was it. Um, and I was working with Fortune 500s with people who made six to seven times I did um, were white cis men and could tank my whole career. So if I'm a copywriter for a Fortune 500 and my client says, Candace, can you use that new meme to create a tweet? I don't really have the privilege to question that because I might lose my job, which tends to happen. So a lot of companies hire a lot of people of color, but what happens? People leave. Why do people leave? It's things like this. You're actually forced out. So if you realize that you're in a situation and you have privilege, without putting too much work and stress on other people, it's about figuring out what privilege you have and where it could be leveraged. And the other side of that is who you're trying to influence. If I walked up to my sales team and said, I want to decolonize the internet, therefore we can't communicate this way in email, Honestly, I don't think they would even know where to start with that, and they would probably just laugh at me and walk away. If I went up to my sales team and I said, I've noticed that in the past 12 months, there have been a lot of news articles about communications like this. This represents a big risk to our company because we could be called out. They might say, huh, interesting. We should think about this differently. So it's not just your pr privilege. It's who are the folks under siege that you're trying to elevate? And it's you as a person, what privilege do you have? And then it's the people you're trying to influence, where do they come from and how do they think? So in this part of the presentation, uh, I just really wanted to kind of give a few examples based on different teams you might be talking to. So when I work with a design team, so that could be a copywriter, it could be a creative director, it could be a visual designer, it could be a UX team, editors, I usually talk about, is this in the mission of, of the company? And is this in the brand voice? Or how can we establish this in the brand voice? Because if you notice with that Twitter example, would you say that AAVVE is their brand voice? No, at least not the one that I see. So when I notice something that might be a appropriative, I tackle it that way. But a big step I try to take, whether it's with a client outside of the company or a vendor or my own company, it's when we create design guides and brand guides, I actually add a section about this. And I try to have examples of what it might look like to appreciate something and the steps that have to be taken as well as what it looks like to just steal something. And then that's great because if someone notices that something is appropriative, they don't have to shame anybody. They can just point to the, to the design guide or the brand voice guide and say, hey, this does not fit a standard that we have established throughout the whole, whole company. Please take these steps to make sure that we've appreciated that, that team. Uh, so that's kind of what you, you could do with the design focus, is really talk about the mission, um, talk about the problems you're trying to solve, and talk about the brand voice and all of that. Whereas if I'm working with sales or with marketing or business ops, I've talked about risk. Um, it is a huge risk to be called out on Twitter by anyone for doing something that they think is even racist or, or is it's, it's racist and it's erasing. And that could be risky because it could actually change all of the relationships you have with clients. So I might bring that up. But I'll say that even with sales and business teams, I tend to think about the mission of the whole company. And typically, if you work at a startup, you have a very lofty mission. I'm not going to get to all of that right now, but you might be like, we're here to increase access to widgets because there has not been access to that. And this will change if everyone had at least two widgets 
<laughs> everything would be different and all the problems would just float away. Everything would be decolonized and safe and secure. So typically that's how startups talk about their mission. Um, use that, right? Because if you walked up to your boss and you're like, hey, I want to, to decolonize this, not going to listen, but if you're at a job and you're a group of people working toward a mission, if you say, we're here to serve this population, yet we're doing, we're not honoring where this content comes from, that's a different conversation, and I think that you could actually move forward. Um, in terms of another hard thing to work with, or just hard thing is external clients, because typically those are people paying the business, and the rules are different. But whenever I work with external clients, I also talk about, I usually will package some kind of value add. So I'll say, oh, I'll send you a biweekly report about competitors. And in that report, I'll say, oh, these are competitors who got a lot of kudos for this content, and it seems to be pretty cool. But also, here are competitors who are doing things that are getting them um, in the media for bad things. So this company was called out for this tweet, or this company has an ad campaign, and it uses... Um, in indigenous stuff and that's not okay. So typically when I send something like that over and I frame it that way, the external client is happy that I'm even doing that extra work and then it starts to influence how they see things because clients just wanna win and they want to win as cheaply as possible. So I'm not gonna go to them and say, I'm anti-racist, we, <laughs> we need to stop doing this. I'm going to go to them and say, it looks like this audience isn't obvious. It may be that we can start to market to this audience and build a real community around it by having this agency help or having these artists come in and work with us. So it's just about framing it the right way. Um, yeah, so I think that, and then even with product developers, web developers, I think this is all very important things to uh, talk about because people think that it's just the copywriters or the business ops people who influence the final product. It's really everyone. So if I am in an open source project and I'm reading documentation and there is appropriation all over it, I don't really want to interact with that project and I will tweet about it. So I think that when I'm speaking to web developers, I just talk about, you know, what are the, what's the problem we're trying to solve w with this technology, and does this language help us do that, or does it hurt us do that? And it's beyond language. I mean, appropriation is so deep, it's the actual structure of how we operate. So these are all very hard conversations, so privilege is very important, too. Um, if you feel like you might get fired for bringing someone up, for bringing something up, I mean, I'm not saying you should just go and do it anyway. I think that hopefully you have someone there that you could work with who has more privilege so that you don't have to take that. Because at, at the end of the day, if I'm always having to leave a company because I'm bringing up how racist they are, that's not inclusion. And that's way too much work for me to be doing. So I thought we could uh, communicate with our neighbors for a minute. Just talk about maybe one concrete thing you might use or a question you might have. Uh, you have maybe 30 seconds to do that, and then we'll come back. So I should see people turning and communicating in any way that they can. Okay, everyone should be uh, turning back to me. Everyone raise your hand when you're ready to get going again. Everyone's hands, or just look at me. Get, give me eye contact if you're ready as well. That works, great. So I hope you had great conversations and that you <laughs> continue them um, elsewhere, not right now. Uh, if we had more time, I would do a share out because I used to teach and I love that stuff. Uh, but what I will point you to is I made a gist on GitHub. Uh, so if you go to gist, G-I-S-T dot github dot com backslash teacher C and click on that file for this talk. There are links, and I will update this file with more info as I get it. Um, and I'll tweet this out, too, in case you didn't get this. And, yeah, so thank you. Um, I'm at Twitter at, at Teacher C. Feel free to email me at writecandice at gmail.com. I hope that, I mean, I hope that we all take concrete steps to deter this, but I also just hope that we're more empathetic to where a lot of our content is actually coming from and who is being compensated or not compensated for that work. Thank you.